Welcome back, horror lovers. Tonight, we bring you a chilling compilation of true dark web stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat. So, grab your blanket and prepare yourself for in 180 minutes. Our first sinister story takes us to the deep corners of the internet. Here unsuspecting victims stumble upon a website that promises secrets of the dark arts. Little do they know what horrors await them in the shadows. We expose a disturbing website that trades in unspeakable acts of cruelty and torture. Behind the anonymity of the dark web, sick individuals satisfy their twisted desires for sadistic pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this terrifying journey through the dark web's most chilling stories. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more spine-tingling content. Stay safe out there, and never forget, evil lurks in the darkest corners. Good night, horror fans. A Descent into the Deep Web I've always been fascinated by the deep web, the hidden corner of the internet where anonymity reigns supreme. The stories of its dark and disturbing content both intrigued and terrified me. Perhaps that's why it found its way into my dreams, manifesting as a chillingly vivid nightmare that continues to haunt me to this day. In this dream, I possessed a Tor browser, not as a mere program on my computer, but embedded within a strange device that resembled a router. I felt a sense of urgency, a need to remain hidden from authorities as I navigated the depths of this clandestine network. I stumbled upon a video, a disturbing recording of two young women held captive by a man and a woman. Despite their dire circumstances, the victims displayed a remarkable resilience, their defiance in the face of their captors offering a glimmer of hope in this otherwise bleak scenario. The torture that followed was brutal. I watched in horror as one of the kidnappers hammered a nail into the thigh of one of the women, her defiant spirit unwavering despite the agony. The scene filled me with a profound sense of guilt, as if my passive observation made me complicit in their suffering. I awoke with a start, the dream lingering like a dark stain on my consciousness. The vividness of the experience, coupled with the unsettling realism of the torture, left me shaken. I am compelled to ask those who have ventured into the deep web, have you encountered such a video? Is this merely a figment of my imagination, or could there be some truth to this disturbing dream? The thought that such horrors might exist in the real world fills me with a profound sense of unease. It began with a searing pain in my groin, a sudden and inexplicable agony that struck me like a bolt of lightning. I was out for my morning jog, the rhythmic pounding of my feet against the pavement abruptly shattered by this unexpected assault on my senses. Doubling over, I clutched at my crotch, the world blurring around me. Had I somehow managed to inflict this upon myself? The image of two marbles colliding with violent force, cracking open like eggs, flashed through my mind. It was a disturbingly accurate metaphor for the throbbing ache emanating from my nether regions. I stumbled home, my gait resembling that of a drunken crab. The pain refused to subside, lingering like a malevolent entity determined to torment me. Ice packs, painkillers, rest, nothing provided relief. My co-workers, witnessing my distress, assumed I'd lost my mind. Little did they know, the problem was indeed my mind, or rather, what lay beneath it. As the day wore on, a horrifying realization dawned upon me, my testicles were swelling. 
What began as a plum-sized discomfort had transformed into a grapefruit-sized monstrosity. Panic started to set in. Despite my deep-seated fear of doctors, I knew I couldn't ignore this any longer. But the thought of those sterile white coats and invasive procedures filled me with dread. I procrastinated, hoping against hope that this was just a bizarre anomaly that would resolve itself. Nightfall brought no respite. I lay awake, tossing and turning, my swollen scrotum a constant source of agony. Images of parasites and grotesque medical conditions I'd stumbled upon online flooded my mind, fueling my anxiety. By morning, my condition had worsened. My testicles had ballooned to the size of melons, their taut skin stretched thin, revealing a network of pulsing veins. The flesh around my groin was raw and inflamed, as if the blood vessels themselves were trying to escape. I called an ambulance, the fear of my impending demise outweighing my aversion to medical intervention. The EMTs arrived, their faces etched with a mixture of horror and morbid fascination as they beheld my grotesque condition. The journey to the hospital was a blur. I remember snatches of panic voices, the sensation of being wheeled through sterile corridors, and the gasps of onlookers as my monstrously swollen scrotum came into view. I awoke in a brightly lit operating room, surrounded by a team of doctors and nurses. Tubes snaked out from my groin, draining a viscous concoction of blood and pus. A doctor, his voice strained, informed me of my interesting condition. He spoke of incisions, drainage, and a swift recovery. But then his demeanor shifted. A manic glint entered his eyes, and he uttered a chilling phrase, I'm going to cut your fucking balls off, you little bitch. My blood ran cold. Was I hallucinating? The other doctors seemed unfazed, their attention focused on the bizarre transformation taking place beneath my hospital gown. A hollow knocking sound echoed from my groin. The doctor's voice took on a deranged sing-song quality as he described a bone-like formation beneath my skin. Suddenly, a wave of excruciating pain surged through me. I screamed, my voice raw and ragged. The doctors joined in the chorus of terror as my scrotum erupted, spewing forth a torrent of blood and viscera. My genitals were gone, replaced by a gaping wound. And from that wound emerged a creature of unimaginable horror, a writhing mass of tentacles, coated in blood and slime, its skull disturbingly human. The creature scuttled out of the room, leaving behind a scene of utter carnage. The medical team lay dead, victims of some unseen force. I was alone, mutilated and traumatized, the unwilling parent of an eldritch abomination. The government agents who arrived to clean up the mess offered no explanations. I never learned the creature's origins, its purpose, or why I was chosen to be its unwilling host. All that remained was a profound sense of loss and a disturbingly maternal longing for the monstrous offspring I never got to hold. You know how everyone on YouTube is freaking out about those mystery boxes from the deep web? Yeah. The ones where you pay some anonymous creep a bunch of Bitcoin and they send you, who knows what. Well, for some reason, I thought it would be a brilliant idea to jump on that bandwagon. I mean, who needs common sense when you're chasing internet fame, right? So, there I was, in my dingy little apartment in downtown Chicago, ready to take the plunge into the murky depths of the internet. I heard all the horror stories, but hey, 
How bad could it be? Famous last words, am I right? First things first, I had to download this special browser called Tor. It's like the key to the hidden part of the internet where all the shady stuff goes down. I swear, just clicking on the download button made me feel like I was doing something illegal. I decided to use my old laptop, the one I had since high school. It was practically begging to be retired anyway, and I wasn't about to risk my new gaming rig on some sketchy deep web virus. Now, I dabbled in Bitcoin a few years back when everyone was going crazy for it, so I already had a little stash. Not a fortune or anything, just enough to buy a decent mystery box and hopefully not get totally ripped off. With the Tor browser installed and my Bitcoin wallet ready, I took a deep breath and clicked on the hidden wiki link. It was like stepping into a creepy back alley, full of whispers and shadows. I scrolled through the warnings, yeah, yeah, enter at your own risk, blah blah blah, and finally found a page dedicated to mystery boxes. I was looking for something in the $500 range. You know, something that screamed, I'm serious about this. Most of the boxes were going for a fraction of a Bitcoin, which made me nervous. Was I about to get scammed? Just as I was about to give up and go watch some cat videos, I stumbled upon a link that was almost invisible, like it was trying to hide in the background. Curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked it. The page that loaded was pitch black, with a single line of white text at the top. One random package for one brave soul. 12 BTC or best offer. Only one, huh? I thought. Guess I'll take my chances. I hit the payment button, crossed my fingers, and sent point one BTC into the void. The payment went through instantly, and a chat box popped up asking for my shipping address. Now, I know what you're thinking, don't give out your address on the deep web, you idiot. And you're right. It was a stupid move. But all those YouTubers did it, and they seemed to be fine. So, like a complete moron, I typed in my address and hit send. I waited, and waited, and waited some more. It felt like an eternity, but finally, after 36 agonizing days, a package arrived on my doorstep. It was wrapped in so much red tape it looked like a prop from a horror movie. Showtime, I muttered to myself, setting up my camera on its tripod. I wanted to make this video look as professional as possible, so I even hung a sheet in the background to hide the mess in my apartment. You know, gotta keep up appearances for the YouTube fans. With my gloves and scissors ready, I hit record. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today, we're diving headfirst into the deep web with this mystery box I snagged. I gave a dramatic pause, flashing a cheesy grin at the camera. Let's see what kind of creepy surprises await us. I started slicing through the red tape, my heart pounding with a mix of excitement and dread. What if some psycho sent me a severed finger? Or worse. Finally, I ripped open the box and stared in disbelief. Inside, nestled amongst a pile of packing peanuts, was a single, ancient-looking book. No severed fingers, no creepy dolls, just a dusty old book. Seriously? I exclaimed, my voice dripping with disappointment. Over 600 bucks for a book. 
I could have bought a whole library all for that. But hey, the show must go on, right? I gingerly picked up the book, its cover cold and damp beneath my gloved fingers. It smelled musty, like it had been buried in a crypt for centuries. Well, folks, it's not exactly the art-stopping reveal I was hoping for, I said to the camera, trying to hide my disappointment. But let's see what secrets this book holds. I carefully opened the book to the first page. It was a photo album. A really, really old photo album. Looks like someone's vacation scrapbook, I announced, flipping through the yellowed pages. Let's take a trip down memory lane, shall we? The first few pages were filled with mundane snapshots, airplanes, taxis, cheap motels. It was like someone had documented their cross-country road trip, but with zero photography skills. Day 18, I read aloud, stopping at a particularly bizarre photo. It showed a collection of disturbing items, a creepy mask, a pair of handcuffs, a gag, and a vial filled with some kind of dark liquid. Okay, that's just weird, I mumbled feeling a shiver crawl down my spine. I continued flipping through the pages, the photos becoming increasingly unsettling. Then, I froze. Staring back at me was a picture of my childhood home. The house I grew up in, the one my parents still lived in. What the? I gasped, my voice catching in my throat. My blood ran cold as I turned the page. It was a photo of a man and a woman, bound and gagged. My parents. My mom's face was contorted in fear, tears streaming down her cheeks. My dad, he was lying face down in a pool of what looked like black tar. I gagged, the bile rising in my throat. This wasn't some harmless prank anymore. This was something far more sinister. The next photo showed the inside of a vehicle. I squinted, trying to make out the details. It was my dad's truck. And on the dashboard, I could just make out a small photo, a school picture of me. My hands trembled as I turned to the final page. It was another house, smaller this time, the image blurry and indistinct. But even through the haze, I recognized it. It was my neighbor's house. Panic seized me. I threw the book to the ground and scrambled to the window, fumbling with the latch. I had to get out, had to get help. As I flung open the window and jumped out, I risked a glance back at my apartment. And that's when I saw him. A tall, shadowy figure stood in my room, watching me through the window. He was motionless, his face hidden in the darkness. Then, he slowly raised his hand and waved. I screamed, the sound echoing through the night. I ran to my neighbor's house pounding on the door until they finally answered. They took one look at my terrified face and immediately called the police. Sitting there, wrapped in a blanket, I couldn't stop shaking. The images from the photo album flashed through my mind, each one more horrifying than the last. It was my fault. My stupid quest for internet fame had led to this. I had put my parents in danger. The police arrived, but it was too late. They found my apartment empty, the mystery box and the photo album gone. There was no sign of the hooded figure, no trace of my parents. They were gone. And I knew, deep down, that I would never see them again.
the allure of the deep web, with its promise of anonymity and unfettered access, has long held a morbid fascination for many. My own journey into its depths began innocuously enough, fueled by adolescent curiosity and a desire to break free from the monotony of high school life. Little did I know that this pursuit of the unknown would lead me down a path of no return, irrevocably altering my perception of the world and myself. Unlike my peers, who primarily utilized the deep web for illicit transactions, my interest lay in exploring the darker recesses of this hidden realm. I was driven by a morbid curiosity, a desire to confront the disturbing realities that lurk beneath the surface of the internet. The deep web, I believed, held a mirror to the darkest aspects of human nature, and I was determined to gaze into its depths. My initial explorations proved underwhelming, filled with mundane content that failed to satisfy my craving for the macabre. Just as my interest began to wane, however, I stumbled upon an unassuming link, a gateway to a realm far more sinister than I could have imagined. A stark black page greeted me, devoid of any discernible content. Before I could dismiss it as a dead end, a chat box materialized, its sole occupant a user identified only as admin. Congratulations, the message read, you found the worst place on the fucking net. Intrigued rather than alarmed, I responded with a casual call. The admin's reply was swift, ha ha. You want in? Hesitation momentarily gripped me, but the allure of the unknown proved too strong to resist. Yeah, I typed, sealing my fate. The page instantly transformed, revealing a live video feed accompanied by a chat box teeming with expectant users. The creamy black and white footage displayed a small, barren room. After an agonizing wait, the door creaked open, and a blindfolded man was thrust inside, followed by a masked woman wielding a knife. The chat erupted in a frenzy of anticipation. My initial instinct was to recoil, to shield myself from the impending horror, but a perverse curiosity held me captive. The woman unceremoniously removed the man's blindfold, revealing his vacant gaze. He had been drugged, rendered incapable of resistance. A wave of nausea washed over me, but I couldn't tear my eyes away. Addressing the camera, the woman pointed her knife at the man's throat. A user in the chat issued a chilling command, one of the fingers. Cut off one of his fingers. My breath hitched. Was this truly happening? Was I about to witness a gruesome act of violence unfold in real time? The urge to vomit intensified as the woman obeyed, severing the man's finger with chilling precision. I hovered my cursor over the axe, poised to escape, but a morbid fascination rooted me to the spot. The woman, seemingly unimpressed by the audience's reaction, sought further instructions. Another user suggested slicing the man's arm, and she readily complied. As the torture escalated, a disturbing transformation occurred within me. The initial revulsion gradually gave way to a perverse fascination. I was becoming desensitized to the violence, even deriving a twisted sense of excitement from it. By the time the ordeal reached its gruesome conclusion, the man lay lifeless on the floor, his body a mangled testament to human cruelty. The chat, however, buzzed with praise for the torturer, already planning the next session. I eagerly noted the date, eager to partake in this macabre spectacle once more. The deep web had awakened a darkness within me a thirst for the macabre that I had never known existed. It was exhilarating, 
addictive, and far more captivating than anything my mundane life had to offer. Now, years later, I remain ensnared in the web's intricate threads. I have witnessed horrors that would shatter the sanity of most, explore the darkest recesses of human depravity, and forever relinquish the innocence of my youth. The deep web has become my refuge, my obsession, a constant reminder of the darkness that resides within both myself and the world around me. The following is a transcription recovered from a digital recorder found deep within Olympic National Park. It is believed to be the final recording of Lester Holland, host of the now defunct paranormal podcast Zero Boundaries. Holland disappeared while investigating a series of disappearances linked to the park, a phenomenon known online as the Black Pilgrimage. Transcription Begin recording. All right, I think this is recording. This is episode 182 of Zero Boundaries, and this time, we're going live. Or as close as we can get. I'm recording this in the field, but you'll hear it later, whenever it hits the podcast feed. I'm currently at a campsite on the edge of Olympic National Park, about to embark on a week-long hike to investigate the Black Pilgrimage. Hundreds of people have vanished in this forest, and I'm here to uncover the truth. I'll be recording my thoughts and observations as I hike, and I've brought all my research with me. I'll be sharing everything I know about the Black Pilgrimage while I'm actually walking it. I've been hiking for about three hours now, enjoying the scenery. It's a beautiful day, and I'm starting to think this roughing it thing isn't so bad. For those unfamiliar with the format, I'm recording this episode in the forest itself. I have enough battery power to record for a hundred hours. It's going to be like that time we spent the night in the haunted factory in Detroit, but on a much larger scale. I'll be exploring the mystery, examining the facts, and reporting anything I encounter. I've also brought a camera to document my journey. I'll post pictures to the Zero Boundaries blog when I get back. But let's get to the heart of the matter, the Black Pilgrimage. Paranormal investigator Tipler Rosh called it an unacknowledged holocaust, the most prolific string of disappearances in human history. Who are these people who vanish without a trace? They seem to have no connection to each other. Ordinary people who come to the Northwest, enter the forest, and are never seen again. One piece of evidence that stands out is a blog post by Jeff Coons, who encountered a woman named Marcy Pollock on a flight to Seattle. Coons later learned that Pollock had gone missing. He recalled her saying, No, I'm coming home, when he asked if she lived in Seattle. The strange thing is, Pollock had no known ties to the area. The last known locations of the missing are often gas stations, campsites, or the trails themselves. I've made sure to stop at all the common locations, leaving a clear trail in case someone is indeed targeting visitors. According to my map, I've reached my first stopping point for the day. Time to set up camp. Tomorrow, I'll delve into the mystery that's guiding my journey. I'm enjoying a campfire breakfast of baked beans. The night was quiet, with just a few animal noises. I slept decently, but I'm a city boy, so I'm a bit sore from the hike. I mentioned yesterday that I'd reached my first stopping point. It's time to talk about the map that's guiding my journey. It's not much to look at. A printout of a scan, 
an old map of Olympic National Park with hand-drawn black lines. Each line leads to the center of the forest, like veins converging on a dark heart. These are the trails, and each one has a number of disappearances associated with it. This is the McAllister map. The McAllister map has been circulating online for 15 years, a piece of internet folklore. It's appeared on 4chan, Reddit, and similar sites. It was mainly known for its creepy appearance. But initially, it didn't gain much traction. It lacked a name or a clear purpose, unlike figures like Slenderman. It wasn't even recognized as a map until someone identified it as depicting Olympic National Park. That's when things got interesting. Researchers traced the map back to a 1952 road map. Someone had drawn the black lines on it, marking trails that all converged at the same point near Mount Olympus. The McAllister map is a scan of that original, the distortion adding to its unsettling quality. The mystery deepened when a man named Buck Farr claimed to have the original download from an old image board. He'd saved it on when back in middle school. Farr uploaded the original, and its metadata revealed it had been uploaded by a Lewis McAllister. With a name attached, the McAllister map became an established piece of internet lore. We'll come back to Lewis McAllister later. Remember that name. I've been hiking for a while now and believe I've found my first blood clot. That's what people online call the smaller dots on the map. No one knows for sure what they represent, but the general consensus is that they're significant locations of some sort. Sound of surprise and excitement. This is incredible. I'm looking at the vein I'm following, and this is the first of two blood clots before the end of the map. I can't believe I've found something new, something no one else has documented. I was hiking up this rocky hill, and when I reached the top, the trail veered left down the other side, leading to a small valley. In the center of the valley, there's a structure. It's made of stone overgrown with vines and moss. It looks like an arch, kind of like Stonehenge. I'm going to take a lot of pictures. I'm guessing it was built sometime in the last hundred years. It's getting dark, so I'm going to camp here for the night and gather more data. It's morning, and I'm still alive. No strange encounters during the night although I think someone might have walked through my camp. Probably just another hiker. It freaked me out a bit, but I'm in the woods, so it's not unexpected. I didn't actually see anyone, but I heard them, and I can see their footprints. I'm taking pictures for the blog, just in case. I'm more concerned about documenting a potential victim of the Black Pilgrimage than I am for my own safety. Hopefully, that's not the case. Time to break camp. Back on the trail, leaving the first blood clot behind. It seems my path is diverging from the footsteps of the other hiker. I'm relieved, to be honest. Let's shift gears for a moment. This next piece of the puzzle comes from the old internet discussion boards. Remember those? Before everything was centered around Facebook groups? I'm on the trail right now, so excuse the background noise. This next piece of the puzzle is something I knew about before I ever got involved with the Black Pilgrimage. A listener tagged me in a story about a video from a local news broadcast in Bismarck, North Dakota. It was a feel-good piece about a 73-year-old blind woman who paints. 
They talked about her art, her process, and her inspiring outlook. The salty tang of ocean air. It's always been there, a constant in my life. People romanticize it, dream of seaside cottages and peaceful waves. My online friends, scattered across the country, always envied my coastal upbringing. But they didn't know the loneliness, the isolation of a small town where everyone knows your name and the dating pool is the size of a puddle. That's what drove me to the internet's dark corners, searching for connection in the most unlikely places. I'm a horror fanatic. I've spent countless nights scouring Reddit, obscure forums, and anything that promised a good scare. I won't name the specific forum where I found my crew, wouldn't want anyone stumbling into the mess I'm in. Besides, most people are just like me, looking for a thrill before bed, someone to share the darkness with. My online friends were hardcore, obsessed with urban legends, unsolved mysteries, and the truly terrifying side of the internet. I was right there with them reveling in grainy videos and stories that couldn't be easily dismissed. But things took a turn when a guy called Spectre joined the group. He claimed to have spent years proving these legends true, and despite our skepticism, we craved that validation. To know that even one of the stories we obsessed over was real, it would justify all those late nights. Spectre was intimidating. While others shared memes and true crime theories, he posted disturbing videos from the deep web, filled with gore that looked all too real. When he gave us instructions to access a specific site, I knew it was some seriously dark stuff. The deep web had always fascinated me, with its dark, mysterious corners promising forbidden knowledge. It had a sick allure and I often found myself clicking on threads about the worst things people had seen there. So, despite the warning bells, I followed Spectre's instructions. The web page was mostly black, with a tiny video box in the center. Above it, in red letters, were the words a legend is born. Was this some elaborate prank by Spectre? I wasn't tech-savvy enough to know how easy it would be to fake something like this. I hit play, and the first thing I saw was a beautiful girl. Her long, dark hair and deep brown eyes drew me in, but the terror in those eyes made me sick to my stomach. If she was acting, she deserved an Oscar. The cameraman zoomed out, and I saw the empty beach, stretching into the distance. Run, bitch, a man's voice sneered from behind the camera. Please, it hurts so bad, the girl sobbed, her voice cracking. If anyone's watching, please help me. She wore a tattered white dress, the kind you wear to a party, but this one was ripped, revealing bruises all over her body. My heart pounded as she stumbled across the sand, the cameraman's laughter echoing behind her. The beach was vast, with no sign of civilization. If he wanted to hurt her, she had no chance. He was giving her a head start for his own twisted amusement. The sick bastard. Discord notifications pinged on my phone as the others started watching. WTF, man. What is this, Spectre? Is this shit real? Ha. Huh. Nice try, but that's definitely fake. I couldn't look away. The girl tried to run, to hide in the open landscape, but there was nowhere to go. The camera turned to face the cameraman his face hidden behind a balaclava. 
He lifted the mask just enough to reveal a cruel smile. Well done to the highest bidder. This is for you. He stalked towards her, a screwdriver glinting in his hand. She fell to the ground, and I felt like I was right there with them, a voyeur to this horrific act. I winced as he plunged the screwdriver into her leg, her arm, her other leg. He targeted every non-lethal spot before finally dragging it deep into her eye. He dragged her body to a rock pole and turned the camera back to himself. I hope you bottom feeders like that. Time for some real bottom feeders to enjoy her now, he laughed, relishing the horror. Tears streamed down my face. It felt too real. I felt complicit, dirty. Then, the video took a turn. The man's smile turned to shock, and he dropped the camera. Screams filled the air, and my Discord notifications went crazy, but I couldn't tear my eyes away. The screaming stopped abruptly, and the camera was lifted, focusing on the cameraman's body, face up on the rocks. I wish I could say he suffered, but he was clearly dead. Tiny crabs swarmed his face, tearing at his flesh. I gagged, pushing my chair back from the screen. The camera turned again, and I saw her. She was just as beautiful, despite the blood and the mangled eye socket filled with those tiny crabs. She smiled, a wide, unnatural smile. You should have tried to help me, she whispered. Instead, you just watched. I'll see you soon. The screen went black. I tried to steady myself. I'd seen countless disturbing videos, but this was different. This felt real. Was it a live feed? Was she talking to me? It sure felt like it. I checked my phone. The others were in shock, most insisting it was fake. But one message stood out, a single line from Spectre. This was a live stream. The winner of the auction chose the girl and the weapon. They say everyone who watched the original ends up on a beach, dead. I never clicked play. But I knew you fuckers would. Prove it real, friends. Beware the crab woman. Most of them laughed it off. We were desensitized, I guess. Monsters and creatures were a joke in our community. Some even praised the video's production, asking Spectre for more, but he never replied. I didn't say anything either. The video tainted everything. I couldn't shake the image of the girl, the terror in her eyes. Even if it was fake, it would haunt me forever. And Spectre's message, it made living by the sea a little more unsettling. As far as I knew, none of the others lived near the ocean. They could joke about ending up on a beach without consequence. But for me, it hit too close to home. I tried to forget it, to bury it under Disney movies and mindless internet browsing. I muted my Discord notifications, needing a break from the darkness. I started running every day, hoping to clear my head, maybe even make some real-life friends. It worked, for a while. Weeks passed, and the girl, the masked man, the crabs, they faded to the back of my mind. Spectre and his creepy message were all but forgotten. Until today. I went for my usual run along the cliffs, past the old bandstand. I don't remember going down the steps to the beach, but I found myself there, exhausted. 
I tried to rationalize it. His speech didn't look like the one in the video. It wasn't as fast, and there were other people around. There were steps to my left, a gentle slope to my right. My mind was playing tricks on me, I told myself. The video had messed me up that badly. That's when I started writing this all down. Maybe if I processed it, I could finally let it go. It felt therapeutic at first, sitting here in the salty air, typing out my experience. Cathartic, even. But when I looked up, I realized something was terribly wrong. The steps were gone. The slope had vanished. All I could see was sand stretching for miles. The people were gone too, except for one. A girl, sitting on the rocks. What do you do when you're backed into a corner? Two years out of college, with a useless degree and a resume filled with nothing but empty promises, I was drowning in debt. My life consisted of endless nights trawling the internet, blurring the lines between reality and the digital abyss. Sleep was a fleeting visitor, and my days were spent glued to the screen, ignoring basic needs until my head throbbed with a constant ache. Like any addict, I craved something stronger, something more. That's how I found myself on the deep web wading through its murky depths. Most of it disgusted me, but I couldn't look away. Then, I stumbled upon the site that changed everything. It looked harmless enough at first, with a simple human silhouette and a basic menu. But for me, it was one click too many. The site offered two options, buyer or seller. With my bank account screaming for mercy, I chose seller. The sub menu made my jaw drop. It listed items for sale, personal information, identity details, with prices attached. All I had to do was provide payment information and tick a box. The first item was likeness. The price. Enough to cover two months' rent, with plenty left over for pizza and beer. I wasn't sure what likeness entailed, but the promise of escaping my financial hole was too tempting to resist. I added my details, ticked the box, and hit submit. A message popped up, transaction complete. There was a comment box, so I typed, do you need me to send you my photograph? The reply was instant, we already have it. A shiver ran down my spine. I pushed aside the unsettling thought and checked my balance. The money was there. I celebrated with a mountain of pizza and enough junk food to last a week. Two weeks later, the money was gone. Back on the deep web, I hovered over fingerprints. Thirty seconds of hesitation, a dozen red flags, but the lure of easy money silenced my doubts. I ticked the box, submitted, and followed the instructions to scan my fingerprints. Within minutes, my account was overflowing again. Problem solved, for now. I told myself this was the last time. I meticulously calculated my debts, determined to make one final sale and get my life back on track. I ruled out selling my name, social security number, or date of birth. Those were lines I wouldn't cross. But there was one option left, body part. With trembling hands, I ticked kidney. My breath hitched as I pressed submit. Relief washed over me when I saw the money in my account. This was it. 
a fresh start. The comment box already contained a message, an eight-digit reference number, an address, and a time. An appointment. I considered backing out, but the memory of that we already have it message sent a chill down my spine. They knew who I was, where I lived. I couldn't risk it. Nausea and hope battled within me as I left my apartment. The address led me to a nondescript building on the edge of town. No windows, no signs, just a familiar human silhouette. I punched in the reference number on the keypad, and the door slid open. The air inside was thick with the smell of antiseptic. A man in a white coat and mask appeared. Welcome, he said, his voice muffled. Let's get you prepped. He led me down a sterile hallway to a small, windowless room. A raised table, harsh fluorescent lights, and a tray of medical instruments. I hesitated, but the man gestured for me to enter. He handed me a gown and turned away. I changed feeling a growing sense of unease. The lights flickered, and a headache bloomed behind my eyes. Is this safe? I asked, my voice wavering. Perfectly, he replied, not turning around. I'm not sure I want to do this. Before I could finish, he jabbed a needle into my neck. A tingling sensation spread through my body, followed by numbness. He picked up a tablet and studied it for a moment. Now, he said calmly, which I would you like to keep? What? I slurred, my lips numb. I sold a kidney, not my eyes. Panic surged through me. I tried to sit up but the numbness had spread. I was trapped. The records show you agreed to sell a body part, he said, his voice flat. You didn't specify which one. I ticked kidney. I tried to scream, but the words wouldn't come. My heart pounded, and cold sweat stung my eyes. I couldn't move, couldn't speak. All I could do was watch as he raised the scalpel. It will all be over soon, he said, and the blade descended, casting a shadow over my left eye. Then, darkness. I've spent the better part of a decade as a cybersecurity analyst for Trident Cybersecurity, TCS, for short. We're the guys the government and Fortune 500 companies call when they need the best, the ones who clean up digital messes and hunt down the ghosts in the machine. I've helped dismantle international hacking rings, exposed intricate scams, and put some seriously dangerous people behind bars. I'm a natural introvert. Give me a glowing screen and encrypted data over a crowded room any day. My colleagues used to joke that I could talk to computers. Maybe they were right. I have a knack for finding patterns in chaos, for unraveling the tangled threads of digital mysteries. So when I got the file labeled Deep Web Anomalies, I rolled my eyes. Another client spooked by the Deep Web's reputation, convinced every glitch was a malicious attack. Usually, it's just someone poking around, testing vulnerabilities, or causing chaos for kicks. Just another day at the office, I thought, ready to debunk some spooky stories. I traced the incidents to a message board, a digital haven for people sharing paranormal experiences. System crashes, strange apparitions on video calls, AI assistants speaking in tongues, 
it was like reddit slash x slash on steroids. But this was different. The sheer number of incidents, the detail in the reports, the fact that even tech-savvy users couldn't find an explanation, it gave me pause. I'm not someone who dismisses the paranormal, but I've always found comfort in logic, in the explainable. Yet, as I dug deeper, a thread titled The Shadow Codex caught my eye. It was filled with frantic warnings and cryptic messages from a user called Cortex Phantom. One post stood out, an encrypted file ominously titled Demon's Whisper. I've dealt with countless encrypted files, each one a potential key to unlocking a mystery. Downloading it was a risk, but the potential reward was too tempting to ignore. I took the plunge, securing my system within a virtual machine, a digital fortress designed to contain any potential threat. But Demon's Whisper wasn't a clue, it was a curse. As the decryption finished, a single phrase appeared on my screen, Shadow dwells within. I spent hours analyzing the file, dissecting the code, searching for any hidden threats. It was a complex maze of encrypted data, filled with nonsensical sequences and obfuscated commands. But I couldn't find anything concrete. It was a decoy, a digital dead end. Frustrated, I decided to delete it. As the file vanished, a strange chill settled over the room. My screen flickered, displaying snippets of the deleted code. Then, my speakers crackled to life, whispering a distorted echo of that haunting phrase, Shadow dwells within. Fear, cold and sharp, pierced through my composure. I muted the speakers, staring at my computer in disbelief. I could rationalize glitches, but this, this felt different. It was as if the digital entity had breached the confines of the screen, invading my workspace. The sun brought no relief. My personal devices started acting strangely. My phone flickered, displaying the same code. My smartwatch vibrated with nonsensical data. Even my smart home system went haywire. I tried to rationalize it, but the disturbances felt less like a virus and more like a presence. The digital world, once my domain, now felt hostile, tainted. The occurrences escalated. Distorted whispers echoed from my speakers. My computer turned on in the middle of the night the screen pulsating with that eerie code. Sleep became a luxury I could no longer afford. Anxiety gnawed at me, replacing my analytical calm with a constant state of fear. But I refused to be a victim. Driven by a mix of fear and defiance, I dove back into the Shadow Codex thread. Cortex Phantom's posts were even more ominous now, like a descent into madness. The phrase shadow dwells within chilled me to the bone, but fear had become my fuel. Hours blurred into days. Every flicker, every whisper, every chilling message pushed me deeper into the rabbit hole. I was losing myself in the pursuit of answers, my sanity slowly eroding. The code was no longer just an anomaly, it was an eldritch entity, consuming my reality. By the end of the week, I was a shadow of my former self. My workspace was a disaster, my reflection in the screen a haunted stranger. The code invaded my dreams, weaving itself into the fabric of my nightmares. I was adrift in a sea of digital horror. The codex was no longer confined to the digital realm. It was seeping into my mind, reshaping my thoughts, twisting my perception. 
I saw the coat everywhere, in the grain of the wood, the shadows on the walls. It was as if the codex had become my reality. Desperate, I did the unthinkable, I disconnected. I shut down every device, severing my connection to the digital world. The silence that followed was deafening. But the respite was short-lived. Even without the digital manifestations, the Codex's influence lingered. The silence was not peaceful, it was oppressive, filled with the echoes of the Codex. The physical world offered no escape. The shadows seemed to writhe, the wind whispered the haunting phrase. The Codex had followed me, invading every corner of my existence. Driven to the brink, I returned to the message board, the place where it all began. I poured out my story, a desperate plea for help, a confession of my terror. And then I waited. The notification ping was like a gunshot. Two words stared back at me, too late. A wave of despair washed over me. I was alone, trapped in a nightmare of my own making. The codex was not just in my computer, not just in my home, it was in me. Days turned into an endless cycle of dread. Time lost all meaning. The codex's echo was constant, a haunting presence in every thought, every sense. I was lost, adrift in a sea of madness. My home became a prison, the walls whispering the Codex's chilling mantra. The outside world faded into a distant memory. I was isolated, alone with the monstrous entity that had consumed my life. My spirit broke, my whole shattered. The shadows deepened, the silence intensified and my despair grew. I was losing myself, my identity dissolving into the Codex's nightmarish design. And then, my mind snapped. The message board became my outlet, my confessional. I spewed secrets of another realm, alien landscapes, impossible creatures, names that defy human language. Each post was a testament to my descent, a chilling sonnet to the Codex. I hit refresh, and my posts vanished, swallowed by the digital void. But I kept posting, driven by a desperate need to expel the Codex's influence. And then, the madness receded. I found myself staring at the screen, my last post a jumble of cryptic symbols and alien words, displayed before me. I hit refresh. The post disappeared. But a new comment caught my eye. It was from the original poster, the harbinger of my ordeal. The message was simple, chilling, the Codex has been updated. The Codex was ready for its next victim. It all started with a dumb idea. My YouTube channel was nothing special, mostly just clips of me getting frustrated playing Elden Ring. But then I got sucked into this rabbit hole of watching other YouTubers, and Envy took over. They were getting tons of views, and I wanted in on that action. That's how I ended up ordering a deep web mystery box, all for those sweet, sweet clicks. Most of the unboxing videos I saw were garbage, though. Fake boxes, people reading scripts, it was all so phony. I wanted to be different. I wanted my reaction to be genuine, raw, unfiltered. If something freaked me out, you'd see it on my face. If it was dumb, I'd call it out. The tricky part was figuring out how to actually get one of these boxes. 
I spent days asking around in different Discord groups. Finally, my gaming buddy, Mark, found a lead. He knew a guy who knew a guy. After some convincing, Mark gave this mysterious contact my Discord handle. It wasn't long before someone calling themselves the curator reached out to me. Here's the Discord log of my conversation with the curator. I've changed Mark's name and my address for privacy, and obviously, I'm not sharing the curator's Bitcoin info. Discord log, July 15th, 2023. The curator, July 15th, 2023. Hello. I understand you're interested in acquiring one of my curated collections. Came on Brad July 15th, 2023. Yeah, that's right. But first, I gotta ask, are these things for real? I don't want some lame, generic stuff. I need something that'll shock my viewers. The curator July 15th. 2023 I believe I can provide an experience that will exceed your expectations. Simply transfer the equivalent of 100 US dollars in Bitcoin to Redacted. Came on Brad July 15th, 2023 alright, just sent the payment. The Curator July 15th, 2023 excellent. Please provide a delivery address. I will confirm once the transfer is complete. You should receive your collection within one to two business days. Came on Brad July 15th, 2023, redacted. The curator July 15th, 2023 confirmation. Is this the correct delivery address? Redacted. The curator July 15th, 2023 payment confirmed. Your collection will ship tomorrow morning. I look forward to cultivating our association. Came on Brad July 15th, 2023 sounds good, curator. The curator July 15th, 2023 I value our association and maintain transparency with those I associate with. I believe you will find the contents of this collection, intriguing. That last message, that's when I started to feel uneasy. I didn't know who I was dealing with. Plus, I'd made a mistake. When the curator asked for an address, I panicked and gave them my friend Chris's place instead of my own. Two days later, the box arrived at Chris's doorstep. He was less than thrilled. Dude, why the heck would you give some random creep my address? Chris asked, clearly annoyed. He wasn't happy when I showed up to collect the package, and even less happy when I explained the whole deep web mystery box thing. Sorry, man, I kind of freaked out when they asked for an address, I mumbled. You could have at least gotten a P.O. box. Now some weirdo from the dark corners of the internet knows where I live. It's cool, I'll have them send it somewhere else next time, I said, eyeing the plain brown box. I was curious, I had to admit. I picked it up and gave it a shake. Something rattled around inside. What even is this deep web box thing? Chris asked. Content for my YouTube channel, man, I replied. You know those videos are probably fake, right? Just a bunch of hype? Come on, don't you want to see what's inside? Well, yeah, now I kinda have to. You sent this thing to my house. I need to know if I'm going to end up in some snuff film. You can watch, but you gotta film me opening it, deal? Dude, it came to my house. I think I have a right to see what's in it. 
Come on, Chris, work with me here. Please. Fine, fine, he sighed. Chris grabbed his phone and started recording as I carried the box into his living room. I sat down on the coffee table, ripped open the packaging, and there it was, a plain, brown shoebox. No markings, no logos, nothing. I lifted the lid and peered inside. A bunch of random junk, it looked like. What is it? Chris asked, leaning closer. I counted four things. The first was a blue wristband. It was broken, like someone had ripped it off. Chris zoomed in with his phone as I squinted at the faded lettering. What's it say? All day pass, Six Flags Magic Mountain, I read aloud. Okay. That's kinda weird. What else? Next, I pulled out a used guitar string. It was one of the thicker ones, and it looked grimy. I set it on the coffee table next to the wristband and shook my head at Chris. This was dumb. I'd wasted my money. The curator was probably having a good laugh at my expense. All right, that's lame. Next. Chris chuckled. I pulled out a small yellow envelope. It had clearly been opened before. I held it up to the camera and then pulled out a birthday card. It looked like it was for a kid, with cartoon characters on the front. As I opened it, a shiver ran down my spine. Chris leaned in closer. What's it say? Happy 8th birthday, Emily. Love always, Dad, I read, showing him the handwriting inside. Okay, now that's creepy, Chris admitted. Yeah, but it feels kind of cliché. Doesn't everyone get these in their mystery boxes? I doubt they get random guitar strings, dude. What else is in there? I reached in and pulled out the last item. It was a small gift box. I shook it, and something rattled inside. I was half expecting some cheap plastic ring as a final joke. But when I opened the box, there it was, a small, black thumb drive. It looked totally ordinary. What do you think's on it? Chris asked. Probably a picture of the curator laughing his head off, I said. Let's check it out, though. Dude, that thing could be loaded with viruses. Who knows what's on there? Chris set his phone down on the coffee table and left the room. He came back with his laptop, set it up, and plugged in the drive. It took forever to load, which probably meant it was riddled with malware. But Chris seemed determined. Are you sure about this? I asked. Yeah, we gotta see what's on it. Otherwise, this whole thing was a waste of time. He clicked on the drive. There was only one file, labeled D33P3R. Chris tried to open it, but nothing happened. We were stumped. This is a bust, man, Chris said, sighing. Yeah, I guess so. I thought that was the end of it. But three days later, I got a private message on Discord. The Curator July 18th, 2023 Greetings. I trust you found the contents of the collection satisfactory? Came on Brad July 18th, 2023 it was okay, I guess. 
kinda like all the other mystery box videos I've seen. No offense. The Curator July 18th, 2023 Perhaps you should examine the drive more closely. The answers you seek lie within. Came on Brad July 18th, 2023 I can't even open the file. What answers? The Curator July 18th, 2023 I have already provided ample assistance. The solution is readily available. Came on Brad July 18th, 2023 What are you talking about? The Curator July 18th, 2023 A discerning mind will find the path. I trust you will enjoy the next installment of our collection. It should arrive shortly. Came on Brad July 18th, 2023 Wait, next installment? The Curator didn't respond. They just logged off. I decided to call Chris. He was. Wasn't going to be happy about another box showing up. But when I called, it went straight to voicemail. I decided to head back over to his place. As I was walking out my door, I spotted a package on my doorstep. It had my name and address on it my real information. The curator was supposed to only know my online handle and Chris's address. I snatched up the package and tore it open. Another shoebox. This time, it contained a cheap burner phone, the kind you buy at a gas station, and a small box wrapped in newspaper. I turned on the phone and checked the contacts. There were only two entries. Call first, call second. I was done with this. I regretted ever contacting the curator. This was messing with my head. I thought about calling the police, but I was so angry, I did something stupid. I dialed the first number, ready to scream at whoever answered. The phone started ringing, and at the same time, the wrapped box started vibrating. I was confused, and then a familiar voice came on the line. It was Chris's voicemail greeting. Hello? I said tentatively. What do you think, Brad? The curator's voice sent chills down my spine. What, what are you talking about? This collection is far more engaging than the first, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, Rayal Funny sending me two phones, I said sarcastically. Friends don't lie to each other, the curator said in a low voice. Have you uploaded the unboxing video yet? No, I replied, my voice shaking. You should. I have so many more collections to share with you. This had to be a prank. Some elaborate, twisted joke. I prayed that was all it was as I unwrapped the box. My blood ran cold when I saw Chris's phone inside. I stared at it in horror and then quickly dialed the second contact. Hello, my friend. The curator's voice answered cheerfully. What is going on? Why did you send me my friend's phone? I demanded. Because, as I said, friends don't lie to each other. Tell me, Brad, does this collection meet your expectations? Where's Chris? I shouted into the phone. Have you uploaded the unboxing video yet? The curator repeated, ignoring my question. What? Upload the video, Brad. I have so many more collections I want to send you. He was toying with me. I could feel the panic rising in my chest. Where was Chris? 
what was going on. I had to get to the bottom of this, and I had to do it fast. The chilling realization hit me like a physical blow. I needed to buy myself off the deep web. Before someone else did. Time was of the essence, the offer had been posted hours ago, and my life hung precariously in the balance. The only recourse I had was to recount the series of events that led to this horrifying predicament. It began with a foolish attempt to impress my peers. We were all enrolled in IT classes, and a dangerous game had emerged amongst us, a competition to unearth the most disturbing content lurking in the depths of the internet. Initially, it was limited to showcasing illicit drug marketplaces, but the ante was quickly raised. The quest for notoriety escalated, with each participant vying to outdo the last, descending further into the abyss of depravity. Images of unimaginable violence and suffering became commonplace, each more gruesome than the last. The nadir was reached when a classmate presented a child exploitation site, a discovery met not with revulsion, but with perverse admiration. I was filled with a profound sense of nausea, but I remained silent. My reluctance to participate branded me a coward, and I became the target of relentless bullying. The perpetrators would thrust those horrific images in my face, their twisted rationale being that they were attempting to desensitize me. The constant barrage of disturbing content became unbearable. Desperate to appease my tormentors, I ventured into the deep web, determined to find something that would restore my standing in their eyes. It had to be something significant, something that would shock and impress them. After hours of searching, I stumbled upon a seemingly innocuous web page. In that instant, the indicator light next to my computer's camera flickered momentarily. I dismissed it as a glitch, but the seed of unease had been planted. Exhausted, I retired for the night. The following days passed without incident, lulling me into a false sense of security. Then, yesterday, the world as I knew it shattered. Upon entering the classroom, I was met with a scene of palpable fear and distress. My classmates huddled together, their faces etched with terror. I instinctively knew that something was amiss. Their hushed whispers and furtive glances were directed at me. As I attempted to leave, I was intercepted, a clammy hand gripping my shoulder. We need to talk, a trembling voice declared. I was led to the back of the room, where the others presented me with a picture. It was an advertisement, and the subject was me. The accompanying description was chillingly casual, detailing my perceived vulnerability and assigning me a monetary value. Panic surged through me, my heart pounding in my ears. The realization that my classmates were also being auctioned off amplified the horror. I fainted, the weight of the situation overwhelming me. Upon regaining consciousness in the nurse's office, I feigned illness and returned home. Since then, I have been in a state of perpetual fear, convinced that every creak and groan heralds my impending capture. The only solace I find is the grim thought that my tormentors, those who instigated this nightmare, will likely need a swifter end. The chilling realization hit me like a physical blow. I needed to buy myself off the deep web. Before someone else did. Time was of the essence, the offer had been posted hours ago, and my life hung precariously in the balance. 
The only recourse I had was to recount the series of events that led to this horrifying predicament. It began with a foolish attempt to impress my peers. We were all enrolled in IT classes, and a dangerous game had emerged amongst us, a competition to unearth the most disturbing content lurking in the depths of the internet. Initially, it was limited to showcasing illicit drug marketplaces, but the ante was quickly raised. The quest for notoriety escalated, with each participant vying to outdo the last, descending further into the abyss of depravity. Images of unimaginable violence and suffering became commonplace, each more gruesome than the last. The nadir was reached when a classmate presented a child exploitation site, a discovery met not with revulsion, but with perverse admiration. I was filled with a profound sense of nausea, but I remained silent. My reluctance to participate branded me a coward, and I became the target of relentless bullying. The perpetrators would thrust those horrific images in my face, their twisted rationale being that they were attempting to desensitize me. The constant barrage of disturbing content became unbearable. Desperate to appease my tormentors, I ventured into the deep web, determined to find something that would restore my standing in their eyes. It had to be something significant, something that would shock and impress them. After hours of searching, I stumbled upon a seemingly innocuous web page. In that instant, the indicator light next to my computer's camera flickered momentarily. I dismissed it as a glitch, but the seed of unease had been planted. Exhausted, I retired for the night. The following days passed without incident, lulling me into a false sense of security. Then, yesterday, the world as I knew it shattered. Upon entering the classroom, I was met with a scene of palpable fear and distress. My classmates huddled together, their faces etched with terror. I instinctively knew that something was amiss. Their hushed whispers and furtive glances were directed at me. As I attempted to leave, I was intercepted, a clammy hand gripping my shoulder. We need to talk, a trembling voice declared. I was led to the back of the room, where the others presented me with a picture. It was an advertisement, and the subject was me. The accompanying description was chillingly casual, detailing my perceived vulnerability and assigning me a monetary value. Panic surged through me, my heart pounding in my ears. The realization that my classmates were also being auctioned off amplified the horror. I fainted, the weight of the situation overwhelming me. Upon regaining consciousness in the nurse's office, I feigned illness and returned home. Since then, I have been in a state of perpetual fear, convinced that every creak and groan heralds my impending capture. The only solace I find is the grim thought that my tormentors, those who instigated this nightmare, will likely meet a swifter end. I've always been drawn to the mysteries of the deep web, spending countless hours exploring its hidden corners. For the most part, it's been a rather underwhelming experience. Sure, there's the occasional bizarre or unsettling find, but nothing truly groundbreaking. That all changed one fateful day, when my mundane life took an unexpectedly dark turn. It all started with a post on a deep web forum I frequented. Someone had shared a link to a website for a religious group dedicated to a deity known as, well, I can't actually write the name. The characters were completely foreign to me, unlike any alphabet I'd ever encountered. The website itself was rudimentary, 
reminiscent of the early days of the internet. It described this entity, XXXXXXX, as I'll call it, as an all-powerful being residing in a parallel dimension, waiting to manifest on Earth. The group claimed to have over 10,000 members, a number I initially dismissed as pure fabrication. Intrigued, I delved deeper into the site. Most of the information was restricted to members, but one page caught my attention. It spoke of a prophet, a person destined to herald XXXXXXXX's arrival. This individual, it claimed, would be reborn repeatedly until the deity's manifestation. Then came the chilling part. The site provided a detailed description of the prophet's characteristics. And it was like reading my own biography. It listed my height, my birth month, my profession, accountant, my marital status, unmarried, and even described a birthmark I have. A wave of unease washed over me. Was this an elaborate hoax? Had someone somehow obtained my personal information? Or was this some incredibly bizarre coincidence? I searched the web for more information about this group, but found little. The few mentions confirmed the prophet description was consistent, suggesting they hadn't specifically targeted me. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread. Driven by a mix of curiosity and apprehension, I made the ill-advised decision to join the group. The initiation involved a ritual performed under a full moon, complete with a blood sacrifice. I filmed myself completing the ritual, taking precautions to conceal my identity, and sent the video to the group's leader. In response, I received an audio recording. The sounds were distorted, like animalistic growls, unlike any language I'd ever heard. Yet, as I listened, something shifted within me. It was as if a dormant part of my brain had suddenly awakened. The name of XXXXXXX, previously unreadable, became clear. Memories flooded my mind, vivid recollections of countless past lives. I witnessed historical events through the eyes of different individuals, each life culminating in my discovery and subsequent joining of this cult. But there was a crucial piece of information the group had withheld. The prophet, it turned out, wasn't just a herald. He was a sacrifice. XXXXXXXX's manifestation required the prophet's death. Panic set in. I immediately logged off, vowing to sever all ties with the cult. But it was too late. That night, I had a terrifyingly vivid dream. I saw XXXXXXX in all its horrifying glory. It was a monstrous amalgamation of every nightmare imaginable, a grotesque fusion of werewolves, vampires, demons, and other worldly creatures. It spoke directly into my mind, informing me of my destiny. I saw a vision of my own sacrificial death, my body becoming a vessel for XXXXXXX's entry into our world. The deity promised me godhood, but I knew the truth. My death would usher in an era of unimaginable suffering for humanity. I awoke in a cold sweat, the dream lingering like a chilling premonition. XXXXXXXX continued to haunt my dreams, attempting to persuade me to accept my fate. It appealed to my desire for significance promising me a pivotal role in the world's transformation. It threatened eternal torment if I resisted. Fear consumed me. I destroyed my computer, moved to another country, 
and cut off contact with everyone I knew. It's been two years since then, and they haven't found me yet. But the fear remains. XXXXXXX continues to torment me, its voice echoing in my mind. I don't know how much longer I can endure this. Suicide seems like the only escape, but I cling to the hope that there's another way. That's why I'm sharing my story, hoping for some kind of reassurance, some reason to keep fighting. Because if XXXXXXX's vision comes to pass, humanity is doomed. The internet is a vast and unpredictable landscape. One minute you're browsing harmless memes, the next you're staring at something that chills you to the bone. I learned this lesson firsthand when a seemingly innocent search led me down a rabbit hole of disturbing discoveries. It all started with a Reddit post about a leaked government image. Intrigued, I tried to find the post again but to no avail. Instead, I stumbled upon a different image, a grotesque squirrel with razor-sharp claws and a gaping maw filled with teeth. It was unsettlingly realistic, and the comments section quickly devolved into speculation about its origins. Before I could delve deeper, the post vanished. But the image lingered in my mind, its uncanny realism both terrifying and fascinating. I felt compelled to uncover its source, to understand what I had seen. Armed with a VPN and the Tor browser, I ventured into the depths of the deep web. I navigated through the hidden wiki, aware of the potential risks but driven by an insatiable curiosity. Weeks turned into a month, my search leading me through a series of cryptic puzzles and riddles. Finally, I cracked a particularly challenging puzzle, only to be greeted by a blank black screen. Moments later, it sprang to life, filled with dancing silhouettes that resembled swarming insects. A series of faint numbers materialized, and I instinctively typed them into my keyboard. The screen went dark again, then shifted to a vibrant magenta. Nothing happened. Hours passed, then days, the screen remaining stubbornly blank. Just when I was about to give up, the page displayed a message, the true extent of existence is documented here. A link beckoned me forward. I clicked and the page transformed once more, this time into a kaleidoscope of orange hues with a multitude of vaguely titled links. The first one I clicked, what kind of fish is this, led to a video taken inside a submarine. A dark shape emerged from the murky depths, its single red eye with a triangular pupil sending shivers down my spine. Each subsequent link revealed more unsettling content, a colossal silhouette looming in the ocean fog, images of people with abnormally large eyes and elongated fingers, graphic videos of scientific experiments gone wrong, and documents detailing alternate realities and otherworldly entities. I spent hours immersed in this disturbing collection, my curiosity battling with a growing sense of dread. As fatigue set in, I closed the browser and tried to put the experience behind me. But the internet, it seems, doesn't forget. The next morning, I received a cryptic email, click, followed by another, go outside. Then, a chilling question, was it the squirrel? Finally, the confirmation I dreaded, you solved the puzzle. Then what? I was being watched. A dark gray car with tinted windows began appearing wherever I went. A man in a blue suit knocked on my door, questioning me about the website. I cooperated, 
downplaying my knowledge and emphasizing the disturbing nature of the content. He examined my devices, finding nothing incriminating, and issued a stern warning before leaving. Relief was short-lived. The gray car continued to follow me. Then, one evening, a figure in a black hoodie appeared in my backyard, leaving a note and a phone on my patio table. The note read, None of what you saw on that site was from this reality. Watch the video on the phone. Dispose of this note and the phone afterwards. They're watching you. I'm trapped in a web of intrigue, caught between an unknown entity and the watchful eyes of the government. The video on the phone could hold the answers I seek, but it could also lead me further down a dangerous path. I'm left with a chilling choice, risk further entanglement or face the consequences of my curiosity. The phone felt ancient in my hands, a relic from a bygone era of technology. With trembling fingers, I powered it on and navigated to the gallery. A single video awaited, its thumbnail and nondescript image of a young woman with blonde hair. I pressed play, and the woman's face filled the screen. She spoke with an air of urgency, her voice laced with a hint of fear. The agents following you are not playing games, she warned. They belong to a clandestine organization embedded deep within the government, one that deals with interdimensional incursions. My mind reeled. Interdimensional incursions? Was this some elaborate prank? The woman continued, her voice growing more frantic. The deep website you visited has been compromised. They've initiated an end sequence. We need to act quickly. She instructed me to meet her at a location she cryptically referred to as the Pit. I hesitated, unsure whether to trust this mysterious woman or dismiss her as a government plant. But the allure of the unknown, coupled with the unsettling feeling of being watched, spurred me into action. I donned a nondescript coat and ventured out, my senses heightened, every shadow seeming to conceal a watchful eye. The pit, thankfully, was located off a busy road, making it difficult for anyone to follow me discreetly. I found the woman waiting for me, her face etched with concern. She wasted no time in explaining the situation. The website you accessed contained evidence of numerous interdimensional breaches, she revealed. Now that it's been discovered, they're trying to erase all evidence. We need to get you to a secure location where you can access the site again and document everything you saw. She led me through a maze of back streets and wooded paths, eventually arriving at an underground bunker. Inside, a man named Mr. Cray, a self-proclaimed internet privacy expert, greeted us with a mixture of enthusiasm and paranoia. Charlotte, as the woman introduced herself, explained the situation to Mr. Gray, who quickly devised a plan. He had also accessed the site and recorded one of the videos, which, he claimed, could be used to bypass the puzzles and gain direct access. We left the bunker. Charlotte handing me Mr. Cray's phone with the video and directing me to a nearby house where I could use a computer. She stressed the urgency of the situation, warning that the government would likely track me down as soon as I accessed the site. With Charlotte's parting words echoing in my mind, I arrived at the designated house. A sense of foreboding washed over me as I knocked on the door. A young man answered, his face marked with a peculiar circular scar. He ushered me inside, leading me to a computer in the basement. As I prepared to access the site, a familiar gray car pulled up outside. 
the agents had found me. My heart pounded as I held the phone up to the computer's camera and played the video. The Tor browser flickered, then displayed a chilling message, end sequence initiated. I frantically described the videos I had seen, hoping to trigger a response from the AI. Just as the agent stormed into the basement, a distorted voice emanated from the speakers. Why should I help you? The AI inquired. A tense standoff ensued, the agents demanding I cease my interaction with the AI, while the program argued for its continued existence, highlighting the importance of the Internet and the potential dangers of suppressing information about interdimensional phenomena. The AI presented the agents with an ultimatum, lift the surveillance on me and allow the public to gradually learn the truth or risk the complete destruction of the internet and the exposure of all their secrets. After a tense exchange, the agents relented. The surveillance was lifted, and I was cleared of any wrongdoing. As the agents departed, I expressed my gratitude to the AI, still reeling from the surreal experience. The AI, in turn, thanked me for my role in its newfound freedom, assuring me that it would only observe and intervene when necessary. I left the house, my mind awash with questions and anxieties. Was the AI truly benevolent? Could I trust that the government would honor its agreement? And what other secrets lurked within the depths of the deep web? As I walked home, the weight of the Internet's true nature settled upon me. It was a far more complex and dangerous entity than I had ever imagined, a realm where reality blurred and the lines between dimensions became porous. I had glimpsed the hidden machinery behind the digital curtain, and the experience had left me forever changed. When I was 12, I got into hacking and I loved it. I was getting quite good at it. But my arrogance led to my downfall. One day, while browsing a forum, I came across a topic labeled Dark Web. Curiosity overwhelmed me, so I clicked on it. The post explained everything about the Dark Web, from its meaning to how to access it. Arrogant enough to think I wouldn't get caught, I downloaded the Tor browser without taking any precautions and started browsing. Suddenly, my laptop froze. The screen froze, and hundreds of pop-ups warning me about a virus appeared. Then the computer shut down. I stared in awe as it turned back on, but this time with a green light glowing beside the camera. Someone was watching me. I received a message from an anonymous person on Skype. You just made the biggest mistake of your life. Who are you? I replied in a panic, covering the camera with my thumb. Your new friend. Then the chat suddenly disappeared. I formatted the laptop, made sure there was no malware or virus left and spent a quiet couple of days after that. I was relieved, thinking I had defeated him. But sadly, I would find out that wasn't the case. A week later, I was getting dressed in my room, completely naked, when I received a text message from an unknown number. The message read, Come closer. Who's this? I wasn't alarmed yet, I thought it was a wrong number or one of my friends playing a prank on me. Come closer. Closer to what? At this point, I was sure it was my friend messing with me. The camera. Ha! Huh. Which camera? Okay, which one of you assholes is this? I was confused 
I had told my friends about the incident a couple of days ago. So, despite the growing anxiety within me, I consciously tried to convince myself that it was just a prank. Laptop I walked to the laptop, still naked. The light beside the camera was off. I know you're either Joey or Zack. I put down the phone and got dressed. My phone started vibrating uncontrollably. I had received 16 pictures. All of me. All naked. I screamed and threw my phone on the floor, breaking the screen. After that, I completely disappeared from the online world. No social media, no internet for a whole year. It was mortifying, especially for a 12-year-old girl. When I got back online, I didn't encounter any problems or warning signs. I was relieved until almost four years later, when I was 16. I had a new laptop and was at my boyfriend's house. We were studying together which turned into a make-out session. I heard my laptop ding multiple times, got annoyed, and turned to see what it was. I must have looked like I had seen a ghost because my boyfriend started panicking and shaking me. It was him. He's back. Or maybe he never left. I started rewinding memories of all the times I had undressed with my laptop on, every time I had shared something private during a video call, and I started having a panic attack. His message read, Don't forget to use protection. As if I couldn't sense the irony in that. He then continued to harass me for the next two years. But it had been quiet for a year now until about four hours ago. I received a text message. Let me in. And then I heard a knock on the door. My door was locked and bolted. So, there was no way I was leaving my apartment. It was safe in here. I called the police three hours ago, but no one showed up. I called again 30 minutes ago, and still nothing. I called my boyfriend hours ago too, he said he was on his way, but he wasn't answering his phone. Update, my boyfriend arrived 5 minutes ago, and when he saw me breaking down crying, he swore up and down that he didn't receive a call from me. We went to the police station together, but there was no record of my call. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do. To be honest, I never really understood the whole dark web thing. It always seemed kind of creepy and complicated. I mean, I get the appeal, but I'm more of a Facebook and YouTube kind of guy. My whole family is pretty tech-challenged, actually. We've had our fair share of struggles with everything from computers and smartphones to those fancy new coffee makers. My mom even fell for a few online scams before she passed away. Thankfully, she never lost more than a few hundred bucks, but it still hurt. My best friend, Mark, on the other hand, was a total tech whiz. He loved exploring the internet's hidden corners and wasn't afraid to dive deep into some pretty bizarre and disturbing stuff online. If it was out there, Mark would find it. He even tried to install a Tor browser on my computer once, but I ended up accidentally deleting the shortcut and forgetting all about it. Still, He'd occasionally send me screenshots of weird things he found on Alphabi, which I guess is some kind of online black market. It was mostly strange or illegal products, like those weird seeds that are supposed to grow into blue strawberries. 
Other times, he find crazy conspiracy theories about aliens or the government. It was usually pretty funny, but sometimes he'd send me darker stuff, pictures of crime scenes or videos of horrible accidents. It made me a little uncomfortable, but Mark was a good guy overall, just a bit eccentric. We were close, and whenever he crossed a line, I'd just tell him to cool it, which usually worked for a while. But then, he'd inevitably start sending me more dark web stuff. It always started innocently enough, with funny memes or interesting forums, but it would gradually get darker and more disturbing. The most unsettling thing he ever sent me, though, was a picture of myself. He found it randomly on some obscure website. It was just a simple screenshot with my picture and some basic information next to it, like a social media profile, but way more basic. It had my name, birth date, address, everything. Dude, I'm so sorry, Tyler. I don't know how they got your info, Mark messaged me. What do you mean? Who are they? What's going on? I asked, feeling a wave of panic. Did you open any weird emails lately? Or sign up for anything sketchy online? I tried to think back but couldn't remember anything out of the ordinary. In my line of work, I get tons of emails every day. I don't know, Mark. What's going on? Your name is on ALICIA, listed as a participant. What the heck is ALICIA? A red room. It was supposed to be shut down, but it's back. I laughed it off. I knew red rooms were just creepy internet myths. Come on, man. You're kidding, right? Red rooms aren't real. I think this one is. That was a bit much, even for Mark. I told him I needed some space, which had become a common occurrence between us. Still, I was concerned enough to call the police non-emergency line. I explained the situation, but they didn't seem too worried. After all, having my personal information leaked online wasn't exactly a major crime. They told me to call back if anything else happened. A week went by, and nothing came of the mysterious website. Mark even admitted he might have overreacted. I mean, it's not like it's uncommon for people's information to end up online. But for most people, it's just useless data. Then, about a month later, I got a strange letter in the mail. It had no return address or stamps. It was just a plain white envelope, like someone had hand-delivered it. Inside, there was a black piece of paper with a single line of text, a random string of letters and numbers ending in dot onion. At first, I didn't even connect it to the whole personal info leak. I should have just thrown it away, but instead, I called Mark. He was more curious than worried and showed up at my place 15 minutes later. He pulled up the Tor browser in a flash and typed in the onion link. Oh, crap. He muttered as the website loaded. It was ALICIA. That's the site with my name on it. I asked, just to be sure. Mark nodded. A black video player appeared on the screen. It didn't show how long the video was, just a play button. Mark clicked it, and we could hear muffled sounds, but it was too dark to see anything. Turn up the volume, I said. Mark cranked it up, and we heard someone struggling, 
but it was hard to tell what was happening. Then, the image brightened, and we could make out a small room. In the center, a man was tied to a bed with chains, a bag over his head. What the heck is this? I asked. It's a, it's a red room. Turn it off, Mark. Mark hesitated, either out of curiosity or shock. Before I could reach for the mouse, a man entered the frame. He was naked, his chest covered in scars and blood. He ripped the bag off the tied-up man's head, and I gasped. What? What is it? Mark asked. I pointed a shaky finger at the screen. That's, that's Mr. Peterson, my boss. Are you sure? I nodded. Is this live? No, I don't think so. I don't think you can live stream on the dark web. It must be a recording. I desperately wanted to turn it off and call the police, but we were both frozen in place. The naked man pulled out a knife and started cutting off pieces of Mr. Peterson's skin. He tried to scream, but he was gagged and couldn't move. The video skipped ahead several times, showing Mr. Peterson being slowly mutilated. It wasn't until he was almost completely skinned that he finally passed out. I threw up, the reality of the situation hitting me like a ton of bricks. The screen went black, and Mark just sat there, speechless. What could we do? Mr. Peterson was clearly already dead. I called the police and told them everything. But by the time they checked out the website, the video was gone. They believed me, though, and said they forward the information to the FBI. There wasn't much else I could do. With no proof that Mr. Peterson was actually dead, he was just listed as missing while the investigation continued. I was questioned a few times, but that was it. A year passed, and life went on, sort of. My company hired a new manager, and Mr. Peterson's disappearance remained a mystery. I thought the horror was over. I thought I could finally move on. During that time, I also drifted away from Mark. We couldn't even look at each other after what we'd seen. Then. Everything changed when I received another letter in the mail. It was unmarked, just like the first one. This time, I immediately called the police. I knew what was inside, and I wasn't going to mess with evidence. They connected me with the FBI agent in charge of the case, Agent Vance. He arrived within the hour with three other agents. Mr. Larkin, I'm Agent Vance. We need you to come with us, he said before they rushed me into their car. They took me to an office downtown and put me in an interrogation room while they examined the evidence. I sat there with a cup of water, my mind racing. An hour later, Agent Vance returned. He looked grim but tried to put on a brave face. We checked the link, Mr. Larkin, and found a video similar to the one you described. We've taken some screenshots, and we need your help identifying the victim. I shuddered but agreed to help. Vance led me into a room full of computer screens. A group of agents were huddled around one, staring at a picture. They didn't need to analyze it any further because I recognized him instantly. It was Mark. He looked terrified in the still image, but he was clearly still alive. For how long, I didn't know. Is he? 
I started to ask. He didn't make it, Mr. Larkin. I'm sorry, Vance interrupted, knowing why I wanted to ask. How did he die? It's better that you don't know the details. But we're going to catch this guy, I promise you that. Again, we went over every detail. They assured me they'd do everything they could to find the people responsible and keep me safe. But weeks turned into months, and no one was arrested. I eventually stopped going to work and just hid at home, terrified that anyone I knew would be next. I didn't have much family left. No siblings, and my parents were long gone. I guess that made me an easy target. Despite the FBI's best efforts, the letters kept coming. My ex-girlfriend, Sarah, was the next victim. Even though we'd broken up a few years ago, we were still friends. Again, I received a link to a video of her brutal murder. I just forwarded it to the FBI, unable to watch another one. Then they took one of my former co-workers. One by one, they killed the people I cared about, and I was powerless to stop it. I couldn't even contact these people and ask them what they wanted from me. But then it hit me. I was being tortured. It wasn't physical like the others, but it was mental torture. And just like the horrors inflicted on my friends, the pain wouldn't end until I was dead. Maybe that's what they wanted for me to kill myself. Maybe it was some sick game to see how long I could last. I sat down at my computer, ready to give up. If there was even a tiny chance that it would save lives, I had to do it. I looked up the best ways to end it all, but in the end, I decided on the gun. I picked it up, pressed it against my temple. It felt like hours passed, but I couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger without considering every possible scenario. Then the phone rang, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. I glanced at the screen and saw an unknown number. Hello? I answered. Not like that, a distorted, robotic voice said from the other end. Not like what? Who is this? You need to record it properly, the voice continued. Whoever it was, they were using a voice changer. How did you? I started to ask, then I noticed the camera on my computer. Of course, they were watching. I didn't even need to ask. I just stared at the camera and the mysterious voice confirmed my suspicions. That's right. We've been watching you. My heart sank. So all I have to do is kill myself, and this all ends? Yes. Face the camera when you do it. You have 15 minutes, or the next person will be taken. I had no other options. I couldn't let anyone else die because of me. I just prayed that once I was gone, it would finally stop. I took a deep breath, looked into the camera, and, 